This is just the beginning. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Hart from Axios, and thank you so much for joining us for our for the third installment of our series on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on education. Welcome to our audience from, uh, from live streaming on Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, and Axios.com. Again, we are here to talk about the education puzzle. Today, we're talking about jobs of the future and recovery. We'll have three segments exploring the pipeline between schools and the workforce and the importance of upskilling and the future of upwardly mobile uh, careers. Thank you to our sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, uh, for helping put together this event and to our partner, Heartland Forward, for making it possible as well. Please follow along the conversation using the hashtag Axios events and the at Axios uh, handle on Twitter. And also for the latest news, including everything you need to know uh, up to the minute on the coronavirus, please visit our dashboard at axios.com. Now joining us for a, converse, a live conversation is Steve Case, CEO, CEO and uh, Chairman of Revolution, an investment company, and also, of course, co-founder of AOL.com. Hi, Steve. Welcome. Hi, Kim. Good to be with you. Nice to be with you. So, uh, and you and I have talked many times about this, but you've been a prominent voice calling for more investment uh, in places between the coasts, the, between the hubs that get the majority and the lion's share of venture capital investment to make sure that places uh, that generally are overlooked uh, get, uh, get a chance to shine and uh, keep talent in their hometowns and build locally grown businesses. Uh, in a CNBC op-ed yesterday, you argued that Congress should be allocating money to help sustain startups and for entrepreneurs to start new businesses, and also to require that a portion of that funding go to firms outside of the coastal tech hubs. Tell me a little bit about your theory of the case there. Well, first of all, Congress, the White House should get credit for moving quickly to put the CARES Act in place. And obviously, there are a lot of big companies that are struggling and a lot of small businesses are struggling and having a focus on them makes sense. But we can't lose sight of the fact that startups really create the jobs. The Heartland uh, is going to come out with a, a Heartland Forward, a report tomorrow that reminds them of this. Essentially, all net job creation comes from young startups, not from big companies, not from small business. So focusing on those big business makes sense. Obviously, the airlines are under a lot of pressure. Retailers, many retailers, Neiman Marcus, J. Crew are, are going bankrupt. So they obviously need support. When they come back on stream, I don't think they'll be able to have the same number of jobs they had before. And similarly, small business, we need to support those main street businesses. But there are some who closed and will not reopen. Some estimate that 40, up to 40 percent of restaurants may not reopen. So we're not going to get the jobs back there. We have to focus on what has always been the job creating sector of our economy, which are startups. And there's not enough focus on that. So yes, focus on the big businesses. Yes, focus on the small businesses. But let's focus more on these young new businesses. And as you say, not just focus on what's happening on the coast, but what's happening all across America. There are uh, many who are predicting that as a result of this crisis, we're going to see something of an exodus from the major cities as people look for less densely populated areas to live. What kind of opportunity do you think that presents to places like Tulsa or St. Louis or Kansas City, who've often had a traditional problem just getting talent there in the first place? Well, the way I'd frame it a little different. I'd say they had the talent. They just lost it. There's been a brain drain in many parts of the country. Some of the smartest people grew up in the middle of the country. Some of our best universities are in the middle of the country. Uh, but the opportunity was not there, so they felt they had to go to the coast, particularly if they wanted to be in the tech sector and, and, and places like Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is great, but essentially everybody in Silicon Valley is from someplace else. So the question as we move forward is how can we keep some of that talent in place, slow the brain drain, and actually create a little bit of a boomerang of people returning and I think this crisis may be a tipping point. I, I, there are a lot of people who, who are rethinking things and, and using this as an opportunity to take a step back and, and reflect. And there are great things in Silicon Valley, there are great things in New York City, there are great things in Boston, but that's not the only place you can start and scale a company. Startups now are scaling all across the country, but we need to address this, this talent issue. We also need to address the capital issue. You referenced this earlier, but last year, 75% of venture capital went to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. States like 
Michigan, Ohio, less than 1%. California alone, more than 50%. So as a result, the people with that entrepreneurial mindset, not just the tech sector, but other folk, uh, startup sectors, tend to go to the coast, not stay where they are. So if we want to create jobs everywhere, we want to level the playing field in terms of opportunity, give everybody a shot at the American dream. We have to back entrepreneurs everywhere, and that's what Rise of the Rest is, is all about. And you mentioned uh, the, the presence of some of the best universities being in the middle of the country. What kind of uh, responsibility or role do higher education institutions play in making sure that this crisis doesn't completely disrupt that pipeline of talent from getting from the educational institutions into the jobs that we need to be filled once they come back online? Well, as I said, we have a lot of great universities all across the country, but some of the best ones are in the middle of the country. How do you make sure you are using this time also to reflect that, that we've had to move towards distance learning? Some places like Arizona State University has been a real leader in this. As a, way, as a result, they're better positioned. Others are trying to play catch up and figure out what is the role in the short run around more distance learning. And then when we do get back to some sense of normal What's the right mix? What's the right hybrid? We've backed a number of companies in the distance learning area and, and with the idea of flipped classrooms and other kinds of things. It frankly been a struggle for a lot of, of uh, professors to adopt that, teachers to adopt that. It was sort of a cultural change. Now they have an opportunity and really an imperative to, to adopt that. So we have to make sure we are educating these people with the skills they need for the future, including creativity, entrepreneurial skills, sort of the skills that machines can't replace. And then we have to make sure the opportunities in their backyard are sufficient so they don't feel like they need to go someplace. And that's why this capital talent aspect is so important. The last aspect, and again, I think this crisis might be a little bit of a wake up call. I wrote this when I wrote the book, The Third Wave, a few years ago, that this next wave of innovation is not going to be about just apps on your phone. It is going to be about better ways to you know, teach. It is going to be about better ways to deliver health care food, agriculture, smart cities. These are the third wave sectors that are up for grabs. And the expertise about the, you know, agriculture, for example, farming, St. Louis and Louisville are expert in those, not in San Francisco, not New York City. So they have the expertise, that domain expertise. The universities in those areas are terrific at teaching the skills necessary to innovate in things like uh, ag tech. We just need to make sure that the capital is there to, to allow people to pursue those ideas where they are. And for some of the people who did leave, Maybe now's the time to come back. And you also, uh, you mentioned the rise of the rest, um, and you were planning on taking uh, your your latest bus tour to the heartland just a few weeks ago to visit Wichita, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Northwest um, Arkansas, and St. Louis. And I know you've visited several cities in this region before. What would you say some of the unique challenges and opportunities are given the current situation moving forward in that region in particular? Well, it's to really embrace this as a as a tipping point. If, if people don't act in these different cities, whether it be you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, some of the ones you, you mentioned, and they just are you know, taking this for granted, they probably won't be able to keep the talent they have. They won't be able to create this boomerang, this you know, people re returning. They need to make sure they create a strong entrepreneurial ecosystem. And again, the, the Heartland Report that's coming out tomorrow talks about some of these factors. We have published a number of reports that rise the rest talking about the key factors to have a strong startup ecosystem. Collaboration is one of them. And that includes getting the universities to be more entrepreneurial minded on campus and connect their campus and their entrepreneur on their campus to people in their in their communities. That's a, a key way you can retain that, that that talent as opposed to losing it to some other uh, ecosystem. The, the talent aspect is critically important. The capital aspect is critically important. The ideas, the third wave ideas are critically important. And a culture around innovation and, and risk taking is also critically important. And we need to build those skills in many parts of the middle of the country. Steve Case, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Kim. Uh, up next, we have Elisa Villanueva Beard. She is the CEO of Teach for America coming to us from Houston, Texas. But first we have a quick video from our partner, Heartland Forward. What is America's heartland? Is it Appalachia and the Ozarks? The Great Plains? Is it rural or urban? Is the heartland falling behind and forgotten? Or is the heartland rising? Here at the Heartland Summit, we gather the greatest minds from across the country to know the heartland best. We invite you to meet us in the middle. 
let's roll up our sleeves and kickstart economic growth and innovation here in the heartland. So whatever the heartland means to you, vast landscapes or towering cities, let's change the narrative and build the future of the heartland together. Thank you to Heartland Forward for that video. Now joining us live from Houston, Texas is the CEO of Teach for America, Elisa Villanueva Beard. Hi, Elisa, how are you? Hey, Kim, I'm great. Good to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. Um, so you started your teaching career as a Teach for America Corps member in Phoenix, teaching third graders. And you saw first and foremost the inequities that uh, challenge students and schools every day from uh, basic unmet needs like food insecurity and housing. And as we've all mm -hmm. seen and talked a lot about um, in the past few weeks during this pandemic, uh, those inequities have just been magnified uh, by the closure of schools and the rely need to rely on connected and virtual learning. Um, as you think about this crisis, what do you think school districts and specifically teachers, it's fittingly Teacher Appreciation Day today, uh, what do they need to help get students through this uh, response right now, but also through the recovery and into the fall to make sure that students just don't com fall completely behind? Yes. Um, well, I want to start off by just um, giving a standing ovation to all the teachers out there. Um, I. You know, everyone's gotten a taste or many people have proximity to what it is like to be a teacher, given um, that I'm, for example, homeschooling for children and um, folks are, are seeing how how hard and how inspiring it can be to, to be a teacher and to watch our educators take on this transition with such energy and creativity has been really inspiring. So just big shout out to our teachers out there. Um, you know, in, in this work, I one thing that's been on my mind is I've been talking with teachers um, at Teach for America, 20,000 of our network, our teachers amongst the 62,000. And so I've been wanting to really hear from teachers about their challenges and the opportunities they're seeing. And a big thing on my mind is that as we start to talk about solutions, I hope we will center those closest to the problem, which of course include our children and families, but also our teachers and educators. And so the, the big thing on my mind is we don't wanna go back to normal when it comes to education because there were lots of children being left behind um, in that education system. And this is a moment where we can imagine something different for kids. And of course, we've got to meet the needs of the moment, but also start thinking about the future. There are three big things on my mind as I'm thinking about that. Um, the first is we, of course, need a national plan and all hands on deck um, to figure out what interventions are needed starting now, the summer, the fall. Um, and in order to do this in a smart way, we really need good diagnostics, good assessments to know where our children are. We're seeing the research from, from NWEA that is grounding us in the fact and the research that kids are falling far behind with the economic downturn. We are at risk of leaving an entire generation behind. The good news is that we can still do something about it if we get organized and have a clear vision for the future. And that's a big thing on my mind. Um, and as we think about the interventions needed, um, I, I want us to push to have an inspiring vision for this. Um, a lot of folks are talking about learning gaps, remediation. Um, and this is a moment where we can actually be asset based and say, our kids have passions. They are learning things now. Let's tap into what their creativity and their leadership to help us solve this problem and reimagine a fundamentally different education system. And so, but it is all going to start with a commitment to a transformative vision for reopening schools. The second thing is that we need significant investment in funds in order to meet the need of the moment. Um, and this is a lot on my mind and a lot of on, on educators' minds. Um, our most precious natural resources are our students, and this is the time to invest to ensure that we can intervene appropriately given the size of the problem that we are facing. Um, far, um, we have seen funds come from the federal government in this crisis that add up to about $3 billion um, in the $2, $2 trillion that have been invested as aid. Um, $30 billion of that has gone to education. When we look at the last economic crisis, um, 
We had $100 billion um, of $800 billion in stimulus dollars invested in education. That's four or five times less in this global pandemic. And so this is our moment um, to ensure that Congress, you know, what the this next set of relief and recovery package that they're working on is critical as, as we look ahead. And then the final thing I'll say is that um, we have to ar wrap our arms around our students with deep love and support. Um, our children are going to need um, social and mental support. Um, there is a lot of loss happening around them. There's a lot of stress as you know, parents lose jobs, et cetera. And the same is true for our teachers. And so we're gonna really have to support and provide the tools for teachers and students to be able to, to thrive um, and get on a good path as, as we start to reopen schools and, and look into the future. Are you concerned at all about how this might impact the pipeline of teachers and people wanting to go into teaching, given the challenges that we're seeing now? Um, I know that a lot of uh, people who enter Teach for America sign up for two years. Many of them, the majority of them, end mm -hmm. up staying. But, you know, we're talking all about how to make sure that the pipeline of workers and careers uh, stays intact with this crisis. How are you yes. thinking about recruiting and making sure that there's a steady pipeline of, of talented um, uh, people who are wanting to take on this challenge that we're running into? You know, Kim, so we've been in, in strong contact with our incoming teachers, we call them core members, who are going to start teaching this fall with us and preparing for, you know, a virtual summer training that we're going to do with them and all the supports that are going to be required. And as we're in contact with them, actually, we're hearing a deeper commitment to want to get in the classroom. People are seeing the deep inequities that existed far before, you know, this pandemic um, came to be, where kids have so many unmet needs. And this is a moment where we can really lean in to provide our children, all children, and those children who are disproportionately being impacted, which is our children in, in rural and urban America, to ensure that they are getting what is required. And um, our core members, what we're hearing from them is they are ever more committed to want to be a part of this. And so I actually think this is a moment when we can inspire a new generation of folks to want to put their energy and their leadership into this effort, because this is shaping the country is shaping the world and we need the greatest talent coming into schools taking on the the greatest leadership opportunity um, which is teaching and i uh that uh, dovetails really nicely into an audience question that i received and you mentioned a virtual training for some of your incoming core members uh this is coming from washington dc says i am an incoming teach for america core member who was soon moving to nashville to teach middle school math Given the circumstances surrounding the pandemic, I'm trying to use my free time at home to prepare for being a teacher, but I don't know if following the traditional methods alone will help my students build the skills they need for ch a changing workforce. How can I best prepare to adjust to a new format of learning while also being innovative and engaging in my classroom, whether it be virtual or in person? Sounds like there's a lot of questions out there for people coming into the classroom, maybe for the first time. No, that's right. You know, um, I think that the most important thing uh, we can do, one of the big things that we have been doing at Teach for America is, you know, being in contact with students, having empathy interviews, really listening to what's on their mind and, and understanding their needs. Um, you know, relationships are so critical in this as well as high expectations. And so how do we take this moment and ensure that we are um, providing our kids the education that they want and they deserve, and they deserve holding the highest standards while supporting them emotionally and all of the wellness that goes along with that. Um, and I think that's going to be critical as we look ahead. And then just being really grounded in, as as our brilliant core members talked about, you know, the future of of um, of jobs and the kind of education system that we can create that is a more just, relevant one where kids are truly able to learn, lead, and thrive, and where we're putting and building their leadership skills in order to be able to um, meet their full potential. Thank you so much, Elisa, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, and next, we'll hear from uh, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. But first, we have a short video from our sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation.
Welcome back and thank you again to Heartland Forward for partnering with us on this event. I'd like to now welcome Florida, a former Florida Governor Jeb Bush from coming to us live from Miami, Florida. He's also a chairman and founder of the Foundation for Excellence in Education. Welcome. Thank you, Kim. Great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us. I uh, wanted to jump right in. Uh, you published an op-ed in the Washington Post yesterday where you write, it's time to plan for a future in which public education can continue without access to classrooms, not just because of a pandemic, but because that's the future of learning. And you mentioned that it's essential for better preparing the workforce, uh, but you also mentioned that the money is there. That's not necessarily the problem. What's missing is the will to make it happen. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, we spend uh, more per student than any country in the world other than the Benelux countries. We have uh, the 13,000 plus school districts have huge technology budgets, but we don't have a national strategy. And what's become pretty clear uh, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that the access to education when you can't get to the classroom uh, is limited or non-existent for some and works for others. It seems to me we should have a national strategy using infrastructure uh, monies that may come th through, through Congress, the E-rate monies, which are in the billions of dollars, uh, local and state uh, technology budgets, all of this put together to create a national strategy uh, is necessary to make sure that every child has access to learning during these times because the, the virus will come back um, during this next school year. It's likely that many schools will adapt a strategy to have uh, students, not, not all students come every day because of uh, social distancing. And we should be far better, far ahead of the, the, the game than we are today because, um, I mean, I think you live in Fairfax County. Fairfax uh, couldn't deliver. Uh, they just couldn't deliver the technology to the, to the home, whereas Miami-Dade, the third or fourth largest school district had um, every student was was uh, learning online. They had a they trained for it. They they created a strategy around it, um, and and I think kids will be better off in Miami because of that. But uh, th there has to be a national strategy, and there's the resources to do this, and it should be the highest priority. And you're right, I live in Fairfax County now. I actually grew up in Florida on the Gulf Coast, so I uh, lived through a lot of hurricanes and a lot of hurricane days and breaks from school as a result of that. And as governor of that state, who is used to having to make those calls and close schools uh, you know, very quickly, deal with hurricanes and flooding and other natural disasters, what kind of advice would you give to governors who are dealing uh, with, you know, grappling with these decisions of how to keep their economies open, their schools going uh, during this very uncertain time? Well, you can't open the economy uh, until it's safe, obviously, but you can't open the economy if children are at home. There's no possible way most most uh, families um, have to, uh, you know, have to have kids in school if they're going to be able to, to go to work. So um, I think it's it's important for the school districts to create clear, transparent strategies about how they're going to open up. And then we need to deal with the subject that was brought up uh, in this conversation about how do you deal with remediation? How do you deal with the, uh, the, the um, students that have lagged behind? And I think there needs to be a focus on using some of the money that's going to be coming from the federal government to deal with uh, the, the losses of learning that have taken place. That could be through summer school. That could be through um, a, a more targeted, accelerated approach when school starts uh, in the fall. But it is impossible to imagine that we could come close to fully recovering without having our schools open, and they have to open in a very safe way. And I would add higher education is um, struggling with this as well. Both systems are really important for the long-term success of our country. You've also spent a lot of time thinking about workforce preparedness and the role that educational institutions play in building that pipeline. What do you think this crisis will, what kind of impact do you think the crisis will have on vocational training and other job specific education that's possibly outside of the four year university? This was a big issue prior to the outbreak of the uh, pandemic and it's even more important now. Um, first, I think we ought to have as a nas national aspiration that every child graduates from high school college ready and or career ready, that they have under their belt some um, credential that shows that they are capable of 
taking the entry level job that would lead to a, uh, an income that is higher than the median of their community. That should be, that should be our moonshot. Um, and that requires a totally different approach in high school so that uh, young people have access to um, the kind of uh, learning that they're gonna have to be able to, to take advantage of that. The second thing I'd say is that the workforce uh, programs in the, in the country need to be much more reality-based. They have to be based on the fact that, the, that they're training, we're training people for jobs that, um, that are unfilled and that create higher wages so people can live a life of purpose and meaning. Right now, we did a, Excel and Ed did a survey of all 50 states, and some states are on the path of achieving this, but no state has really gotten to the point where they can say, we are providing access to education and training that will deal with the skills gap that exists. And that skills gap will only get larger. The haves will do better in the post-pandemic world for sure. The have-nots, not necessarily. And so this, this should be a time of reflection about how we can change not just our K-12 education, but lifelong learning to deal with these, with these gaps. Steve brought up a really good point that, um, that the, the middle of the country, the heartland of the country, or the, the, the places outside of Silicon Valley and Boston and New York um, are um, poised for significant growth, but they have to embrace these strategies. And many governors, I think, are, are on the right track doing this, but hopefully it'll be accelerated now. Um, in the in the post pandemic uh, world that we'll be living in, and I wanted to um, take that opportunity to go to an audience question. This kind of comes from Washington D.C., and it's: Do we need to redesign the current structural paradigm of education? In other words, does the grammar school high school structure meet the requirements of the twenty first century? And to your point, align with the skills that students need to get those high earning jobs. You know, my hope uh, would be that, as, as has been the case of great disruptions in the past, a series of innovations take place. People think freshly and in, 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 in anew in, in terms of ways of, of doing things. They're not tied to conventionality, and that's my hope. And my, my prayer would be that as part of that, what we would see is that time would be the variable and learning would be the constant, that children could chronologically move up together in the, the, the learning experience, but if they can accelerate their learning, they would have the ability to do it. Uh, and if they were lagging behind, we would remediate so that the gaps wouldn't grow. Um, you could imagine that many, many um, high school seniors could be taking college level work, but very few do. We have the tragedy of high school graduations rates going up, but we have a ton of eighth grade level readers that won't be able to go to college or will have to take remedial reading and math to be able to start. So um, this is the time to really think differently. And I, I think flipping the system on its head where, um, where you move to a customized learning approach, uh, where teachers are trained for that, where they're the coach of the learning experience, where technology is harnessed to, to, to enhance that, where we do focus on the home as much as we focus on the classroom, that never will go away, but that we create a, a very different strategy to assure that people reach their God-given potential. Thank you so much for joining us, Jeb. I really appreciate it. You bet. Uh, thank you again to our sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, and also to our partner, uh, Heartland Forward, for making this event possible. And before we wrap up today, I wanted to bring in my colleague, media reporter, Sarah Fisher. Hi, Sarah. Hey, Kim. How are you? Thanks for being here today. And so given that you've been covering the disruption to the media industry, which impacts every, every community across the country uh, during this pandemic, and got an interesting question from an audience member in Detroit, Michigan, which is, as a former NBC News producer, I'm familiar with the lack of coverage education gets in the media and in politics. Do you think education will be more nationally prioritized post-pandemic? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a tough question. I mean, media at the end of the day is a business and it's a public service. But the problem that we're finding is that media can't perform a public service if it can't sustain its business. And so we've crunched the numbers of Axios before. If you ask people what type of topic do you want to read more of, oftentimes they'll say education. But then if you actually take a look at what they're really reading, if you look at online metrics, education stories fall way low to the bottom of the barrel. 
the type of stuff that media companies tend to cover these days are the things that are getting good clicks. And that right now tends to be, of course, politics. We have an election coming up. But also right now, it's a lot of things around healthcare. People want to know what to do in the immediate term around social distancing and finance. People want to know what this means for their future and their jobs. So the hope is that, yeah, of course, we want to see more education coverage come out of this. But I'm doubtful we're going to see it super soon just because a lot of things seem to be taking reader priority right now. And you and I have talked about this in the past. We've covered a lot of the, the dynamics and the trends when it comes to kids, uh, kids media and kids education and technology. And another part of that question was, will we move toward an education system that is more developmentally appropriate, uh, optimizing students' capacities to learn in a way that makes sense given the economic landscape? It's also a hard question, uh, but and, and something that's hard to predict right now, but it strikes me, um, and I would love your insights, that um, you know, completely structurally changing the, econo the educational system is going to be tough in times like this when other, especially under such economic stress, when other priorities will probably be in the forefront for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think this question sort of gets at what Governor Bush was saying around whether or not we should be rethinking how we stack you know, elementary level education versus middle school versus high school. All these fundamental overhauls, I think we know as a country are necessary. I mean, we tried to do that with No Child Left Behind a few years ago. Of course, that sort of imploded. We know we need the overhaul. I think the problem is, when are we going to find a time when we as a country will put partisan differences aside, will tackle this issue, and I don't think that the coronavirus, while it's shown how important education is and an overhaul of it is, I don't think the coronavirus is going to be that time. Right now, we have a country that's trying to figure out whether or not we can even go back to school, let alone whether or not we can reorganize the system. And so while your reader's question is optimistic, personally, I can't see that happening anytime soon. Thank you so much, Sarah Fisher, for joining us and for your insights after that conversation. And thank you to all of our uh, viewers joining us from all the different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Axios.com. A reminder to check Axios.com uh, throughout the day for updates on, uh, on the coronavirus pandemic, education, and other topics that, uh, that we do cover. Um, and also, you know how to reach us if you have uh, questions or feedback or ideas for future events. I'm reachable at Kim at Axios.com. Pretty easy, so drop me a line. And uh, re wanted to also let you know that if you like this event, you can sign up for the next one that we are hosting here at Axios. Um, on Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m., where the Axios and the Partnership for Public Service are joining CNN's Anderson Cooper and best-selling author Michael Lewis to bring you a glimpse of the work by the 2020 Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medal finalist. Again, that is this Thursday at 7 p.m. and you know where to register. Thank you again for joining us and you know where to find us at axios.com. <laughs>